Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Academy's Moros and Planetarium and this presentation in the Benjamin Dean Lecture Series. I'm Bing Kwok, Assistant Director of Morrison Planetarium. It's good to see you all out here tonight, and we hope you and yours are all doing well and, and are nice and healthy. Tonight, beginning tonight, we are um, simulcasting the Dean Lectures on YouTube. So welcome to the online audience, and for those of you out there, please let us know in the comments where you're watching from. We'd love to find out where you are. Now, there's been a lot happening here at the Academy for the past uh, couple of months or so. We've got two brand new exhibits that just opened up last week. One is called Bugs, if you're interested in bugs. It comes to us from the Te Papa Tongarewa Museum in New Zealand and Weta Workshop. Now, Weta is usually known for movie special effects, but they also are, are into designing interactive museum exhibits, and it truly is a spectacular exhibit with us here through January 22nd. So we we really, really highly advise that you watch, uh, uh, visit that exhibit. Uh, our other is called uh, Hidden Wonders. It showcases some of the most stunning items from the Academy's 11 research collections. Almost 800 items are in this exhibit alone, uh, selected from the nearly 46 million specimens that reside within the Academy's walls. So that's uh, another interesting exhibit that we certainly invite you to come and see. Now, there are lots of other things that have been happening outside the Academy's walls for the past couple of weeks. This has been a very interesting time, astronomically speaking. Um, how many of you saw the lunar eclipse a couple of weeks ago? A few, okay. The view wasn't great from here. It happened at sunset, and it was cloudy that night. I didn't see it. Did anybody see the Tau Herculid meteor shower? No, yeah, nobody else did either. <laughs> well, they, they weren't sure if it was going to be a, a storm, and, and observers saw a few meteors, but not, not a whole lot. And how many of you have been getting up early before sunrise these mornings to observe the planets before sunrise? Well, that's something you should be doing. Because right now, right now, there's a very interesting configuration going on. Um, just before sunrise, uh, we've got, uh, let's see, we've got Venus. Let's see, for you, it's Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Four of the five naked eye planets visible at the same time just before dawn. Uh, later next week, Mercury climbs up out of the sunrise, out of the twilight, to join that. So we'll have five. All five naked eye planets visible at the same time. But wait, there's more. Between June 23rd and 25th, as the moon comes climbing down that line, between the 23rd and the 25th, it'll take a position between Venus and Mars, which means we'll have Mercury, Venus, the moon standing in for Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all lined up in order of their distance from the sun. How many of you knew that? Oh, come on. Okay, well, a couple, a couple. All right. It's worth getting up in the morning to see. So please make an effort to get outside sometime and have a look at the sky. Now, in, in, uh, in other news, in case, you just, in case you missed it, we are looking forward to the first release, officially, of imagery from the James Webb Space Telescope. That has been announced to occur on July 12th. Ooh, yeah, okay, I'm excited too. So keep uh, market calendars. Uh, that'll give us a taste of the instrument's capabilities. Coming up next on the Dean Lecture Series, on July 16th, we'll have Darlene Lim from NASA. She's the deputy project scientist for the Viper mission, which is a rover designed to explore the moon's South Pole region next year, searching for water ice. Then on August 1st, we'll have NASA astrophysicist Jess Dotson, who served as the deputy director in the Kepler Science Office. Kepler is the, the spacecraft that designed, uh, the, the discovered thousands of new exoplanets. And more recently, she helped formulate Ames Research Center's Asteroid Threat Assessment Project, working toward quantifying the risk to Earth of an asteroid impact. Our uh, talks for September, October, and November have not yet been finalized. We're working on it. 
But on December 5th, after a two-year delay, we'll be hearing from Robert Jedeke from the University of Hawaii, and he'll talk to us about mining the asteroids, asteroid prospecting. So that'll be interesting. He's going to do that talk two years ago before the, uh, before the pandemic hit. So he's really eager to come back and give that talk to us. As we confirm future speakers, we'll post announcements on the uh, Dean Lectures section of the Academy's website, www.calacademy.org. Tonight's speaker is an Associate Professor of Astronomy at UC Berkeley. Prior to that, she was an Associate Professor at Northwestern University, a James Arthur Fellow at New York University, and a Postdoctoral Fellow at Harvard. Her current research uses observations from optical and radio telescopes, spacecraft, and even detection of gravitational waves to study the most violent stellar explosions found in nature. Through her work, she and her team are seeking a new understanding of the processes leading to neutron stars and black holes and the creation of heavy elements. After her talk, we'll have a brief question and answer period. Please welcome Dr. Rafaela Marguti. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm very excited. It's a true pleasure to be here with you. And the goal would be to share with you some of the results that we have been having in the world of multi-messenger astrophysics. And when I say multi-messenger astrophysics, what I mean is basically the capability to combine gravitational waves and photons and neutrinos, all the particles, all together. And uh, the title of the talk uh, that uh, you will see soon uh, is about the renaissance of astrophysics. And what I mean is that it's not that we were dead before. What I mean is that this is a very special time for astrophysics where different branches of physics are uh, basically starting to talk to each other like the barriers are falling down. And this is what ultimately enabled renaissance in my beloved country. I don't know if you could tell from my tiny accent. I <laughs> was raised and born in Italy. Right, uh, so today uh, my goal would be to take you at the very edge of knowledge, uh, to see the sea of ignorance, the good ignorance that is the true fuel uh, behind um, any uh, research, but uh, specifically my research. And whenever uh, we are ready, we can start with the presentation, Matthew. So uh, while that happens, uh, let me tell you more. So not only I want to tell you where we are right now in this world of multi-messenger astrophysics, but also want to give you an idea of our life, like what is the true life of scientists? What do we do during the day? And specifically uh, tonight, what I want to do with you uh, is actually uh, to go back to that day of August 17th, uh, 2017, when uh, we got the alert of gravitational waves coming from a neutron star merger and, uh, and just take you through all the events uh, of that day together with me. All right, so we're ready, let's get started. So um, what, I, uh, what I wanted to share with you is again, where is the ignorance? So where is uh, the part that we do not know? And here is how we start from. We start from a big massive star, and what we know very well is that stars that are, let's say, 10 times uh, the, the size of the sun, those stars can't live forever and they explode. Uh, well, no star can live forever, but this particular star, they explode, and we do know very well uh, that they do so, and the big question mark that we have is what is left behind? If I know what star I'm starting from, can I tell you, uh, could I tell you what type of neutron star, what type of black hole do I form? The answer is no, it's a straight no. So one of the questions that we are trying uh, to answer is uh, how do uh, these new compact objects behave? What are their properties when they are born? So what we do know for sure though, is that massive stars, they are on average, uh, uh, they, they tend to hang out in binaries. So on average, your massive star will be leaving and interacting with a binary companion. And uh, we do know that sometimes uh, uh, the, uh, one of the two stars will be massive enough to explode. And then you wait and form a neutron star, for example. And then you wait a little bit, and the less massive star might also be massive enough to explode. 
And let's assume that even this second one produces a neutron star. What we know for sure is that these neutron stars, and we will see in a while why that is so, those two neutron stars, they can't stay there forever, just uh, rotating one around the, the other. But what has to happen is that these two neutron stars lose energy and they will merge. One of the big question marks uh, in this field is what does happen during that merger? What type of light do we produce, produce? What type of gravitational waves do we produce? So those are big question marks that we are trying uh, to answer. So the message that I would like you to bring home is that uh, we do have a big, uh, a big gap in our knowledge, but we live in a very, very special time, in a time during which we can put together uh, light, so all of these photons from the gamma rays all the way to the radio, together with gravitational waves and neutrinos. Since 2015, we can detect gravitational waves coming from the universe. So I keep thinking that I'm extremely lucky uh, to be here uh, standing in front of you uh, telling you that we have this complete new window of investigation of the universe that we can use. All right, so what is the story about? Here is uh, what we will be talking about tonight. Uh, the story is the story of these two neutron stars. Of course, we are looking at an artistic impression. We clearly can see it this way. We will be uh, talking about the story of these two neutron stars that at some point uh, merged and uh, this merger created an extremely violent event in space that was a source of very, very bright, uh, actually luminous uh, electromagnetic emissions, so photons, and also uh, our gravitational waves. So this is the story. Uh, and that happened 130 million years ago. But of course, we got notice, uh, late notice on uh, August 2017. So, all right, uh, so let me give you a little bit of context so that we can appreciate why we got so excited, all the astronomers uh, were got so excited. So let's start with a tiny bit of context. So first of all, let's try to answer this question. So we know we have to form two neutron stars, so how do we go about forming one? So I'm uh, primarily an, an observer, and I do not believe two things unless I can see it. So uh, we do know that massive stars produce sometimes when they explode neutron stars for the simple reason that we can observe some of these neutron stars being born in supernova remnants in our own galaxy. And I'm sure that you recognize that remnant as the Crab Nebula, so the result of a stellar explosion in 1054, so a thousand uh, of years ago. So we do know for a fact, uh, thread number one, yeah, so here we can go maybe to the, to the Crab Nebula Matthew, yes. So we do know for a fact uh, that uh, when massive stars explode, sometimes they produce a neutron stars. And here we're going to appreciate why we are so sure about that. So we are probably very familiar with the picture of the Crab Nebula in the optical, but maybe less familiar, which is exactly this one, all of this fluffiness is the, uh, what is left behind of the, of the star that exploded. But we might be maybe less familiar with the very same thing, but seen through the x-rays. So maybe we can see, here you go. It's the same object seen through the x-rays. And I want to draw your attention to this little tiny dot that has this sort of jetted um, emission. This is uh, coming right from uh, our, to our new neutron star. And if we look at the same object in the gamma rays, so we can switch our glasses and put on uh, the, uh, the gamma ray glasses. So this is, again, our Crab Nebula, but this time seen through uh, the eyes of a gamma ray telescope. So, and here is a beautiful source of gamma rays. So now uh, we can revert back to the presentation mode and the question is, what is producing that those gamma rays? Uh, so these gamma rays, these x-rays, well, this is actually the neutron star. So we have a very good answer to how do we form one neutron star? Great, easy. Uh, give me a big uh, massive star, and sometimes I know I will produce a neutron star. Sometimes I, I know I might produce a black hole. We still don't know when and how, but we at least know that sometimes we can produce a neutron star. Great. But of course, we're not happy, right? Because uh, to, uh, to go back to our initial story, that's a story of two neutron stars. So now we need two of them, not just one. Well, uh, how do we go about having two? 
simple. Uh, one possibility is that we started off as a binary system. This is not the only possibility, but it's definitely one possibility. And then we wait a little while, and the more massive of the two stars will explode first. And then we wait a second, we wait a little bit, and then the second one will also go boom. And at the end, we will be left with two neutron stars, which I uh, put here with this gray, um, uh, gray things. But as you might guess, uh, it's not easy to stay with uh, your partner when your partner is exploding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it turns out it is actually very difficult to stay together. And some of the systems get destroyed when one of the two stars explodes. So some, uh, some systems don't survive this stage. And uh, again, uh, when you have the other one that explodes, it's still not easy to stay together. So it turns out if you do numbers, that only one out of 10 to the 5, out of uh, 100,000 of the systems can actually go all the way to the end and still be together as two neutron stars. So there is one message that I want you to uh, take home. These systems are rare. So we need to be able to resist until the end. They're rare, but it's not impossible, and actually, uh, we know that uh, neutron star binaries are a real possibility. Great. So up until now, uh, we, we know how to form a couple of two neutron stars. We know that we need to be lucky, but it's possible. And now the next question is, can we just stay there happily rotating around each other forever? The answer is a straight no. And we did know that way be before 2017, for uh, the simple reason that if you take your binary neutron star, that's a name, PSR, blah, 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 and you monitor how the orbit shrinks. So here, I don't care exactly what, about what this quantity is. What I want you to know is that this is time, this is calendar year, and this is a measurement of how close the two neutron stars are while they are rotating. And what you have is data points, these dots, and then you have a prediction of general relativity, the Einstein theory. So here is just a prediction, and you can see how well, extremely well, uh, general relativity does in explaining why these two neutron stars are getting closer and closer. So what is happening there? Well, this system is losing energy. How? Through gravitational waves. So even way before 2017, uh, we knew, and this was actually a Nobel Prize for Physics, 1993, we had indirect evidence for gravitational waves. This is why uh, people were so persistent in trying to build the interferometers that we will see uh, we, are, we are using to detect these gravitational waves, because there are really good foundations, really good reasons of why these gravitational, gravitational waves had to be there. Great. So uh, thread uh, number three uh, that forms our, our context. And maybe, Matthew, can we go to the gamma ray burst? So since uh, the 60s, uh, a source, uh, some sources uh, known as uh, gamma ray burst were known to exist. And uh, I want to emphasize the 60s because uh, there is a reason. So uh, back then, uh, and you can see how a gamma ray burst source, what a gamma ray burst source is. It has some uh, fluffy uh, component that is almost uh, uh, completely equatorial, and then it has a very, very powerful jet that uh, travels at the speed of light. This is what we know right now is a gamma ray burst. But, um, and the thing that I want you to bring home is uh, a fluffy equatorial component, and maybe we can rotate around a little bit, uh, Matthew, if you can. Awesome, thank you so much. So, uh, and then we have a jetted component here, very collimated jet, and then uh, something on the equator, and of course we need another jet on the other, uh, the other side to respect the law of physics. So this is, this is how, this is the geometry of a gamma ray burst source. But let me tell you uh, where uh, these gamma ray bursts come from and how did we get to this, to this picture. So now we can revert back to the presentation. So back in the 60s was a very, very particular historical time. And uh, there was interest in trying to monitor other nations uh, when it came to understand if any 
uh, anybody was doing some nuclear tests on Earth. And one great way to understand if somebody is experimenting with nuclear, uh, nuclear bombs is to see if there are gamma rays. Those are byproducts of, your, uh, of, your, uh, of our um, nuclear tests. So these VILA satellites were put uh, in orbit, not necessarily for astrophysical reasons, but to monitor this type of experiment on Earth. And they started detecting bursts of gamma rays that got the name of gamma ray burst. And uh, for years, this gamma ray burst remained a secret. Uh, and uh, it could, they could not revealed, uh, to the, be revealed to the public. And only in the 70s were revealed to the public. After people realized that these gamma ray bursts were coming from all over the place in a very homogeneous, very uniform way from everywhere in the universe which was clearly not consistent with somebody trying to experiment with nuclear weapons. So they were discovered, uh, they were discovered right there. They became known in the, in the 70s. And uh, the, the peculiarity of these gamma ray burst sources was that they produce a lot of energy. How much energy? In a few seconds, these sources emit the same amount of energy that the sun will, uh, will do during the entire lifetime. So they are extremely, extremely powerful. And uh, astronomers soon associated, or uh, they started speculating about what can, what can produce the, all of this energy. And among the possibilities, there were uh, the neutron, two neutron stars that were merging. OK, great. So now, let's stop for a second, and let's think about what we have seen. OK, great, you're still alive. Yeah, you're still with me. Awesome. So uh, what, what, ha what do we know so far? So uh, the summary so far is that uh, we do know how to form one neutron star. We know that sometimes we can live forever. Well, we can live forever. We, we, are, we can stay together uh, as two neutron stars. But we can't really live forever as a couple. We need to merge and, and produce something very violent. So this uh, tells you uh, the three out of the four items uh, that we knew before 2017. So let me now add the last item which is about uh, the chemical, uh, chemical evolution of the universe, or if you want, uh, what produces uh, the different elements in our periodic table. So when I was a grad student, uh, I was taught that uh, stellar explosions uh, were doing it all, that uh, together with other uh, less massive stars, all I needed was just some um, supernova explosion and would be fine in producing the entire periodic table. However, this picture was questioned, and, and that was, was, was happening before 2017. And in particular, uh, it was proposed that uh, actually uh, the supernova explosions might not be the full story, and that maybe we needed some merging neutron stars uh, to produce. Basically, every time you see this orange is an element that is produced um, through uh, mergers of neutron stars. So basically, people started thinking that the mergers of, of neutron stars had something to do with how we produce heavy elements. And I want to make it uh, as concrete as possible. So think about platinum, think about um, gold, uh, if you are wearing some. That might have been produced in a neutron star merger somewhere in the universe, which is pretty cool. All right, so this uh, gives you the context and takes me to what happened what happened on August 17, 2017. So I want to tell you the story of that day and walk you through how we reacted uh, to the alert and tell you how the astrono astronomical community functioned that day or <laughs> dysfunctioned that day. Uh, <laughs> And I also want to be very, very clear, this is my own story, so it's my own perspective. Uh, there were many people involved, but uh, so I, in no way I want to be representative of everybody that lived through this, this experience. Okay, so let's, let's get started. So uh, I talked a lot about the fact that we can now use gravitational waves. And let me give you an idea of uh, what, where we were and what happened in 2017. So starting from uh, uh, 2015, we can detect gravitational waves. So when we find uh, a, a gravitational wave event, we call it GW, gravitational wave. And then the year, uh, 15, this is September 14th. Not very creative, right? And until, until uh, you can see that uh, at, um, the first event said, uh, 
the gravitational wave detectors were able to find were black hole black hole mergers. And what you have here is um, is a cartoon picture, but it resembles the waveform of the of the gravitational wave. And now focus on 170817 is of course is is the gravitational wave event of August 17, 2017. And let's see. Uh, if you can tell the difference between what we have seen until then and 17 So I believe, I believe it takes no scientist, it takes <laughs> literally uh, no training to say that whatever this thing is in the gravitational wave world, it really doesn't look like this. Look how long it lasts. So uh, when uh, we saw uh, this thing, coming, we, we understood right away that, okay, this is not a black hole, black hole, black hole, black hole merger. So you need to uh, pay a very, very, very particular uh, attention to this, to this event. And you can see how, for how long uh, the, uh, the signal lasts. Uh, this is uh, seen through the eyes of, of LIGO. And I want to emphasize this was also the last week uh, that uh, the interferometers were on. So the way it works is that there are different observing runs and uh, the gravitational wave observatories are on for some amount of time during the year. Right now they are off. They will come back online in December uh, this year. And this was the last week, uh, the last week um, and after which they would shut off. Another important um, detail was that this was a Thursday, and if you like, who cares? But uh, it was a Thursday before a very special weekend, which was a solar eclipse. Oh, yeah. And as you might guess, a lot of astronomers took vacations <laughs> for that weekend. And these had some consequences, very practical consequences in trying to slew the telescopes and nobody could do it because we were all on vacation. That's the real life, the one to bring in. That's how science is done. <laughs> so yeah, so what we were uh, witnessing was a neutron star merger. So the LIGO people were able to tell us right away that yes, uh, uh, astronomers, uh, electromagnetic astronomers, we have something very special for you. It's really not like a black hole, black hole merger. So this is actually something you should just drop your vacations and start working basically. That's, uh, that's what they said. So, right, so um, what you're seeing here is what people call the graveyard, <laughs> which uh, another way of looking at it is the new, um, new black holes and new neutron stars that are born after something very violent uh, happens. And you have here, those are masses in units of the sun. So this would be neutron stars with the sun, mass of the sun. And then you can see uh, that uh, here, th these are the uh, big black holes uh, that LIGO has discovered. These are the neutron stars. Uh, these are black holes that we knew of before gravitational waves, uh, before the gravitational wave world. And I, if you see some sort of gap in between these two, you're right to see that. And that's one of the big question marks that we are trying to understand is whether that gap is astrophysical or not. Anyhow, so what are we talking about? Those are the two ones, the two uh, neutron stars that merged. We know uh, their properties through the gravitational wave signal by modeling the gravitational wave signal. And we also know roughly how much mass uh, is uh, bound in the new remnant, we call the new remnant. And uh, most likely that is a black hole, but, but uh, to be honest, we don't have direct proof that this merger produced a black hole. It can be under some um, a little bit of a stretch uh, can also be a bigger neutron star. All right, so uh, here is a story. Let, let's start. So I'll use Pacific times, and those are real times uh, that uh, as I live through it. So at 6 a.m., we get the alert. So the way it works is that you get paged on your phone. You get the alert here. And actually, if you want to tune into the LIGO alerts, uh, there is actually an app uh, if you want to know uh, if LIGO has detected a neutron star or black hole, it's kind of fun. I always tell all of my uh, students that it's kind of fun to know uh, what's going on in the universe. So 6 a.m., we get, we get paged, we get the alert. And we understand, okay, we need to uh, start working on it. But, but not only that, so this is, um, how we look at gravitational wave data for real. So you have here is the time where zero is when the two neutron stars have merged into something else. 
Let's assume that it's a black hole. And then you see here is a frequency, and you can see how we start off here, and then the frequency goes up. You can think about that as relating to the fact that these two neutron stars are rotating very fast, and then they merge. Time zero is when they merge. OK, so neutron, uh, the gravitational waves are telling me, OK, uh, I, I, here we were two, here we are one. But together with that, something very special happened. So uh, this is the time of the merger, and two seconds, two seconds afterwards, the, the gamma ray telescopes registered a burst of gamma rays. So this should ring a bell. We talked about those gamma ray bursts before. This, now we have a gravitational wave source and a gamma ray burst happening two seconds apart. So there is temporal coincidence between these two signals. We got uh, the alert about the gamma ray burst too. They come through a completely different network, but they still uh, get on your phone and they tell you gamma ray burst right there. Great. But uh, uh, we knew that they were te temporally coincident, but how about location? Do they come from the same part of the sky or not? And here is an, the answer to this question. So the gravitational waves, uh, the gravitational wave uh, are not extremely good. Uh, the observatory is in localizing sources. So uh, for all of you that are um, uh, they do uh, that are uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, with astronomical observations. Gravitational waves typically gives you a localization of tenth of degrees squared, They're like roughly there. And not only that, but sometimes there is a degeneracy. So if we were to, lose, uh, to use only LIGO data, so the gravitational wave detectors that are on, in the US, uh, you, would you would have these two bananas, the, the green ones, like green ones. And then, uh, uh, when we put together also Virgo, Virgo is a gravitational wave interferometer that is based in Italy. Thanks to its, uh, its geographical uh, position, it is able to break uh, the degeneracy and tell you, well, look, look in the upper banana only. So let's now ask the question of where is the gamma ray source then? Well, uh, here is the answer. So the spacecraft, the, uh, the, the two spacecraft that saw the gamma rays were this IPN, which gives you this band here, and Fermi. Uh, which gives you this uh, blue, uh, blue blob. The bottom line is that all of these localization regions, they do overlap somewhere. And uh, this is our best localization region uh, that was uh, uh, later refined. It was 28 degrees squared that was later refined to 16, where later mean, means two years later, so not, not useful that day. All right, so let me quantify, uh, let me quantify how big is that area? How big is that area? It's really huge. It's really huge to search with, uh, uh, with the instruments that we use because we also need to, to, do, uh, to go very deep. So uh, here is what happened. Uh, it's 6 a.m. Uh, we get the first alert, second alert. We understand this is the event we have been waiting for. We have been preparing for years for decades uh, for this event. We have gamma rays, we have gravitational waves, so most likely this is a neutron star merger. So we should get our act together. But uh, we had, uh, just like everybody else, we had no access to any telescope uh, that was sitting in the dark. So I'm talking about optical telescopes, you need the night. Uh, and uh, there was no telescope uh, the, uh, for which was nighttime that we could put our fingers on. And the same was true for the, all the other astronomers. And for us, the only thing was to wait. To wait for night to come, and specifically where in Chile. So I'm going to review uh, first the setup uh, of, uh, of my team for, uh, for this event. And then we're going to use uh, the superpowers of Matthew to fly around. So, so how does it work? So in, uh, during the years, uh, we have been thinking hard about uh, this event. So we put down a strategy uh, that is as follows. So what you're looking at here is how a gravitational wave interferometer looks like with these very, very long arms. Uh, and the idea was, well, when LIGO sees something, then uh, it pages us on the phone, we are here, and then we start uh, painting that huge area in the sky with an optical instrument that has uh, a large field of view that can cover big area in the skies uh, all at once. And um, 
when we uh, have paved, after we have paved uh, the entire area and we have found uh, the location where uh, the signal is coming, well, then we repoint the instruments that have a narrower field of view. And here, where uh, we were uh, talking about Gemini, which is uh, in Chile too, and then we repoint our X-rays, and then we repoint our radio. Easy peasy, right? Like, what can go wrong? You go from one to the other, easy. So now let's uh, let's fly around uh, maybe and see where LIGO is just to for us to, to get uh, an idea. So the LIGO interferometers are um, not far, actually not too far away uh, from here compared to everything else. So we're gonna fly there, and we're gonna see the two the two LIGO interferometers, one and the other, and. Uh, together with an interferometer that was sitting in, in Italy, the, those that were, were the ones that were able to tell us, gravitational wave, alert, alert, alert. These are the ones. And our strategy uh, that on paper was extremely easy to put into action was, well, we get the alert, and then we trigger something in Chile. So we can fly uh, to Chile, and specifically the instrument that we had uh, access to is DECAM. Uh, which is uh, on a telescope called CTIO in, uh, uh, in Chile. And our idea was, well, yeah, then DECAM will start just taking very, 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 very quickly a lot of images of the sky and it's going to tell us if something new appeared that wasn't there the previous night. We're going very close, very, very, very close. And then the idea was uh, once uh, once DECAM has seen uh, the location, has found the location of the new source, well, then we go back and we trigger VLA, which is in Socorro. So we fly, uh, so here we're still flying to the dome, yes, in Chile, where observations have uh, to be taken. And there are some non-trivial things about transferring data, by the way, from the top of a mountain all the way to, uh, to where we analyze the data. Yeah, so the idea was, well, uh, we're going to uh, get some images here, process those very fast, uh, all automatized, uh, no human in the loop, and then we're going to trigger our VLA, VLA antenna, the radio antenna in, Mac, uh, in uh, New Mexico, in Socorro. Easy, easy, easy. We would send our alert there, and they will just uh, repoint uh, our favorite location in the sky. And of course, it's not that these telescopes are there just waiting for me to push the button, right? So they are they are taking observations for somebody else. So anytime we tell them to repoint, that means interrupt whatever you're doing, I take priority and uh, you do what I say. So that is enabled through uh, uh, competition. So we need to, every year there is a competition for projects and you need to be ranked very highly to have those superpowers to override everybody. <laughs> In spite of that, uh, it's always good to be very nice <laughs> because the next time around you're going to be the one interrupted. All right, so, and after uh, repointing the VLA, uh, well, then we have to think about space, and we had access to Chandra, which is an X-ray, uh, an X-ray uh, satellite that we uh, are flying to, I believe, right now. And uh, Chandra has a very, uh, very beautiful orbit, so it's not, it's, it's, it's in a high Earth orbit, it means that it goes very, very far away from the Earth. Which, uh, again, you might think, like, who cares? No, you should care, because that means that Chandra can't talk to Earth every, in every moment. So uh, when, when, when it, it takes, I mean, when it comes to uploading uh, the commands or uh, taking the data down, well, that matters. It matters where Chandra, this is our Chandra X-ray uh, observatory is. Yeah, fantastic. So this tells you how we got, uh, we got there thinking to be entirely, completely ready to take advantage from uh, what we knew was something, an event that would have changed the way we do astrophysics. All right, so now we can get back into presentation mode. 
Thank you so much. And this is uh, the theory, <laughs> and now we'll see uh, wha what happened. So here we are, waiting for Godot, we're waiting for the sun to set. And, uh, uh, and this is the instrument that we are using, is a uh, dark energy camera, DECAM. And uh, I told you that uh, the whole plan was to have our machinery to go through images, do differences, blah, blah, blah. But uh, some, uh, some person in our team is actually a professor at UC Berkeley right now, Ryan, uh, did not really trust uh, the system and he started looking at images one by one. And this is a telescope that has something like 60 CCDs every image. So, and those are without astrometry, so he didn't know the coordinates, so it was matching by eye. I guess you can do it if you're an extremely trained, well-trained optical observer. And here is uh, what he sent like 30 minutes after the night uh, has come, had come on Chile. So Ryan is a man of few words, and he chose them carefully. <laughs> this is the email uh, that say, holy cow, holy cow. Yeah, so this is the email that really changed, changed uh, our personal uh, the life of our team. He told us, hey, there is something very, very, very special that is happening in this galaxy, NGC 4993. It's, uh, this is the galaxy, check it out. And galaxy is 40 megaparsecs means really close, really close for gamma ray bursts. This is the closest we have ever seen. Okay, so uh, what caused Ryan to swear? So he was looking uh, at this image. So here I already zoomed in, so it's gonna look like the easiest possible the job. This is the galaxy, and you see blah, blah, blah. And uh, here is what he saw. So let me go back and focus about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, this region here. Yeah, so you can see this source wasn't there. It wasn't there. and. Now this source is there. This source is there, wasn't there the night before. Uh, it is right uh, in the volume where we expected that source to be. It is right uh, in the location in the sky where we expected that source to be. So this is how one of the six independent discoveries of the counterpart, the optical counterpart of that gravitational wave source really happened. So that's a, that's a true story. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is the first but also only time that we were able to do it. After 2017, as you might have guessed, it's not that we were there just uh, uh, rolling dices and um, playing around, but we failed. We failed. So we are trying hard now to find another counterpart. It is all but trivial. So, so what, you're what you're looking at is the first time that we can say this is the result of a neutron star merger and this was uh, happened together with gravitational waves, which I think it's kind of remarkable to be here saying that. All right, so what really enabled uh, this uh, discovery is a very precise localization. So Ryan could tell us point right there really, really, really precise localization, sub-arc second, if you are uh, fluent uh, with astro stuff. So easy, now the game is easy. So this is, uh, it's easy, the game. I know where to repoint, I just need to be very, very nice to my colleagues, but repoint everything I can. <laughs> this is what we did. This is what we did. We started calling up every possible single director of telescope at every possible time without shamelessly asking them to please repoint that, uh, that position in the sky. And this is how um, all the discoveries about all the other uh, counterparts, so not only optical but X-rays and radio, came to be. So the goal uh, was to put together a completely panchromatic view of this event. So really not wasting any photon. All right. So let's get back to our story. The story is uh, the story of these two neutron stars uh, that merge. And while this is a completely artistic version of the story, it does have some pieces that are really important. And specifically, see this structure with the jet and some fluffiness here? This is real. Uh, real, not in the in the sense it looks like this, but this geometry is what we think uh, really uh, applies uh, to this event. And what I want to share with you later is to try to understand what those are, those pieces are, and how and why we we can say with uh, reasonable confidence that this is what we are looking at. 
So again, there are two, uh, this is the picture that I want you to keep in mind, and there are two uh, key geometrical components. So there is something that is uh, almost spherical, and we will see this is where the heavy elements are produced, the gold, the platinum, th right there. And then we have some jets, so something that is uh, extremely uh, narrow and collimated, but that goes at the speed of light. Those are the ones uh, that produce the gamma rays right here. So uh, let's see where we are. So 12 hours, uh, so the gravitational wave trigger, 12 hours after, uh, why 12 hours? Because we needed that night to come down. And then we were able, together with other five teams, to find this counterpart grid. So we were able to repoint the whole uh, VLA, very large array, uh, the radio antenna, very, very, very fast. And 13.7 hours after the trigger, so just one hour after here, we were already on target. This is absolutely remarkable. It could not have happened without uh, amazing efforts by, uh, by all our um, telescope operators. Really, really amazing efforts there. So um, let's see how things look like in the radio. Uh, you saw the little, the little ball in the optical, great. So how do things look in the radio? So, and again, what we think is that the radio is, uh, what we see shining in the radio is the jet, the jet component. All right, so this is the image, the radio image, and we got extremely excited. When I saw this image, I was jumping up and down, and I thought, this is the source. The reason why everything looks so elongated is just because the source is very close to the horizon, so you don't see the real shape, you see the shape through the eyes of your telescope. But great, I thought, yes, we got it. But then we put on coordinates, and uh, the actual position is this uh, yellow circle, and no, I have nothing inside there. What I'm looking at is a radio emission, that's very true, but from what? from the galaxy that is hosting this merger. The nucleus of that galaxy was and is radio break. So while all the optical people were having a lot of fun with their photons in the radio, we were silent, nothing. All right, optical people are getting a lot of fun and they started not only detecting like uh, photometry, so not only luminosity information, but also how the light is distributed uh, in the wavelength, so taking spectra. And uh, let's have a look at the, at the x-rays then. Well, let's see. We were able to get on target, look at that, 2.4 days afterwards. Not because we were lazy and uh, it took us two days to just call up Chandra. No, it's literally the time that it took uh, for uh, the telescope uh, to accept to Zlu in location. So yeah, it takes, uh, it takes longer time. And here is how uh, the world looks uh, through X-ray glasses. What you're looking at here, uh, every little uh, guy here is a photon. So in the X-rays, we can actually count photons. We can name them if we want. And uh, here is uh, the location of our uh, neutron star merger. And uh, I don't think I have to convince you that there is absolutely nothing. Those two photons is background, unrelated background. So just like for the radio, the x-rays, the x-ray world is still without a single detection at two days. So the optical people are having a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, look at the, uh, this is a, a simulation of, of the fluffy component. And you can see how uh, the transient evolved with time. So this is a luminosity and this is time. And you can see how the transient produced a blue component uh, that was very, very uh, fast uh, evolving. So it went up and down very quickly over a uh, time scale of a few days. And then uh, it also produced a longer lasting component, the red, uh, the red curve here, that lasted, let's say, 10 days-ish, uh, which is the place where we form the heavy elements. But the bottom line is that the optical world was really shining bright in the first two weeks. And while the optical world was enjoying uh, this amount of photons and already reaching an extremely important conclusion that this is the place where we form the heavy element. So let me take you, let, let me just say one word about it. So why, why we're so sure? So what you're looking at here is how, the lumin how light is distributed in the near infrared as a function of the wavelength. And 
these wiggles, so uh, these wiggles of this spectrum is what is telling us that we are forming uh, the heavy elements. And you can see a fantastic theoretical prediction uh, by uh, Dan Kazan, he's also a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, where you can see that he predicted the wiggles, and this is, trust me, is extremely good agreement since he did that before the event. So basically, the optical people were getting a lot of fun because they already concluded here, here we are sure we formed heavy elements. So for sure, we found a new place in the universe where heavy elements uh, can be formed. And while all of this was happening for uh, the optical people, radio and x-rays <laughs> were really not <laughs> doing anything at all. We had no detection at all. But after a couple of weeks, finally, we started seeing x-rays and radio. And uh, let me just show you uh, in the x-rays. After 15 days, this is 17 by 17. These are maybe 10 photons, maybe 10 photons but these are the most beautiful photons I've ever seen. <laughs> these are the first X-ray photons uh, that we have ever detected uh, that we can say for sure are coming from a neutron star merger. So these are my favorite photons by far. All right, so great. I thought, yeah, great. Uh, now I can start having some fun too, not only the optical people. And the same thing happened for the radio. So we will see X-rays and radio, uh, even if they come from two opposite ends of the spectrum, they're actually physically very related. The optical, even if it's in between, it doesn't, it doesn't talk to the, uh, to the X-ray and radio. So uh, what, are we, uh, what are we looking at? So of course, we started getting a lot of fun. And uh, this is real life, right? So we started getting a lot of fun. We started uh, thinking, OK, now we have X-rays we can study. but there is the one thing that happens in astronomy, which is the fact that we do have a star that is reasonably close to us and reasonably important for our existence that sometimes just get too close to your source and that means that you can't observe it anymore. So uh, for us, after two weeks, uh, the, uh, the X-rays could not, uh, so the, uh, the spacecraft, the X-ray spacecraft could not report 17 anymore because it was too close to the sun. So the optical was also not accessible, but you know, the optical had already uh, gone up and down, so uh, not a major loss. The X-rays were starting to rise, and, when, and after they did, we could not observe. But the beauty is that radio doesn't have that problem. Radio can see, no problem, no problem at all, unless it's really behind the sun, li literally really behind the sun. But radio could see, uh, could keep monitoring this source. So, Let's see what happened. So let me walk you through this plot. It seems very, very complex, but it's not. So you have uh, light of different types. You have x-rays in blue. You have in purple uh, the optical. And then you have radio here. Two frequencies of radio. I just picked two for fun. And uh, this zero is when the merger happened. And I told you that at the beginning, we had nothing. The optical part that is, uh, uh, that is uh, the kilonova, which is the one producing the heavy elements, is not plotted here. So, and then I told you that at 15 days, uh, we start seeing, uh, 10 days, 15 days, we start seeing some x-rays, uh, and we start seeing radio too. And as you can see, uh, the x-rays could not observe for all the way to 100 days, but the radio could, could fill it up. And yes, uh, the, it w the, what we were seeing is something that was increasing its energy uh, per unit time with time. All right, so there is one feature uh, that is very prominent to your eyes, which is that everything is going up all the way to 100 days, and then things started to go down. And this is, physically speaking, the most important thing uh, that is telling us that there is actually a jet. And let me, let me explain you in a second why. So let's go back to this, uh, to this picture. Uh, this is the part, the fluffy uh, spherical part that is giving us our platinum, our gold, and we're all happy. But, and then we have a jet, and that is the one that is producing X-rays and radio. This jet is very, very, very narrow. It's like a few degrees like extremely collimated emission. So if you think about it, the most likely scenario, uh, if you had to put that jet 
uh, at random, uh, la random inclination is not for us to lie along the jet axis, but the most likely scenario, just from a probabilistic perspective, is that we are off axis, right? So most likely, if I have something that cover it covers a very small um, area uh, in the sky, most likely I'm not inside a small area. Most likely I'm outside. And that's a key. That's a key to everything. So when we see the very, very powerful gamma ray burst is when our observers, which is us, are sitting down the jet. But here, uh, since we detected this source through gravitational waves, we're not sitting down the jet. We are off axis. So basically, here is how it works. So suppose that I'm, um, I am uh, the one that produces the jet. Pr I produce a jet right there, very, very collimated. And you are the observer. At the beginning, you don't see me because I produce all of my light right there. So you are in the blind. But as I decelerate, why I decelerate as a jet? Because I'm interacting with my environment. As I decelerate, special relativistic effects become less prominent. So what happens is that the cone of light that I'm producing as I'm decelerating widens. And at some point, you, the observer, will see me, right? So we start off with something that is very collimated, and then it decelerates and opens up. And at some point, even if we were not in the cone, we start seeing it. This is exactly what is happening here. So uh, this is my cartoon picture where you have the cone that widens until our off-axis observer starts seeing some light. And this is uh, the ultimate reason why we see some uh, rising uh, portion of the light curve first and only after we start going down. And by studying uh, like quantitatively uh, the properties of this type of emission, I can tell you uh, the properties of the jet. How much energy was there? How was that jet decelerating? And, um, and how much mass was in, in the environment? Just, uh, just through dynamical uh, calculations. All right, so uh, if we now uh, go back to these events in uh, August 17, 2017, that we know come from two neutron stars uh, that merged, what we have learned is that we have the fluffy component that uh, in, uh, we call it kilonova. But, and then we also have some ultra-relativistic jets. And for the first time, we can associate these ultra-relativistic jets, which are the gamma ray bursts that were detected in the 60s. For the first time, we can associate them very, very confidently with a physical picture of these two neutron stars that were crushing uh, one uh, against the other. So all of this happened in 2017. Is this over? No. So this thing is still producing photons uh, that we can detect. And uh, the last photons that we could detect were in the, in the x-rays. They started later, but then <laughs> they keep, keep on giving. And uh, let me uh, just go fast forward to the present uh, time. So what you're looking at here is uh, a picture of the galaxy in the x-rays. And this is where 170817 is. And this was taken 3.5 years after the merger. And in no way, if you, if you ask me in 2017, Raf, do you think that uh, <laughs> three years and a half afterwards you will be still here studying the same event? I said, no, please, no. I will, no, absolutely no. And no, we are still here. There is no, no reason why these x-rays should be here. We don't know why they are so bright, but they are. So that is one of the puzzles that we're trying to understand right now. And if you look at the same picture, but in the radio, you can see that uh, there is nothing that we can see instead which is also puzzling because I told you X-rays and radio, they go together. So the reason why uh, we uh, got so excited about these late time X-rays is because, here I don't go into the details, but that uh, this uh, source of X-rays that you see here, this might be related to what type of new object has been formed. It might be related to, am I formed, uh, did I form a new black hole or did I form uh, a new, uh, bigger neutron star? And one very exciting explanation for these X-rays is that they might come from that a new black hole that is a creating mass, basically is eating up whatever was left uh, behind by the two neutron stars that were merging. And that's uh, what we are studying right now uh, in, my, in my team. And uh, there are um, 
uh, yeah, we are trying to uh, basically answer the question, what was formed? And there are new observations that are coming in. Actually, the, they came in maybe a couple of weeks ago that we are analyzing. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, these are the <laughs> last photons from, from this event. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, what we are doing uh, here at Berkeley uh, to actually get ready for the restart of the GW interferometer, uh, interferometers. That is planned to be December 2022, second half of December 2022 which is a very interesting uh, restarting date. And uh, we are building uh, uh, a new survey that is called LS4, La Silla Schmidt Southern Survey, uh, that is uh, PI'd by Peter Nugent. And the idea is basically uh, to use this uh, telescope uh, without having to beg for uh, like favors, uh, but use this telescope to paint uh, the gravitational wave uh, region and find, discover the optical counterparts, and then we point all the X-ray and radio that, that I told you about. So that's how we are trying to get ready with all, uh, with all the uh, help by COVID. Uh, we are still trying to make it. And I also want to point out, I always like this little donkey here <laughs> in the picture. And I believe that's all. I really want to thank you for all of your attention. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful for, uh, for you to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer period in a couple of minutes. For those of you who are unable to stay for that, uh, feel free to exit out through either the top or lower exits. Um, Mary has one microphone, I will have the other one. And since we are also now online, uh, Jackie in the back is going to be monitoring uh, any comments or questions that come in from that audience. And uh, every now and then we might uh, just switch off. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions from here and then see if there's anything online. Uh, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, and either Mary or I will get the microphone to you. One is right in the front here. So, looks like Mary will get there first. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. Really enjoyed it. You mentioned that among the multiple sources but from which you observe this uh, neutron collision, neutron star merger, that one of the things was neutrinos, but you didn't say anything about that in your presentation. And secondly, what are the odds of getting another neutron-to-neutron -neutron gravity wave kind of observation within the next few years. Uh, have you looked at the statistical probability? Yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question because I'm not sure everybody could hear it. So the first question was, well, I sold you the neutrinos, but then I didn't tell, I didn't tell you anything. Yes, that's very true because for this particular event, for 17 or 17 the only part that we failed <laughs> was to find neutrinos. There are limits uh, that, were, that have been put, but there is no detection of neutrinos. That's very true. Uh, it's very true that uh, the neutrino community is uh, trying hard and will uh, try as much as they can to find uh, neutrinos from GWs. And then the second question was, uh, what is the actual probability to have a uh, neutron star merger? And uh, so uh, I have to say that uh, there is already another neutron star merger that has been seen in gravitational waves. But here's the issue. So the horizon of gravitational waves uh, grows as one divided by distance. So uh, it means that their capabilities to detect stuff uh, goes like one over distance. For us that uh, work with photons, uh, our horizon uh, scales like one over distance squared. So we are easily, easily outnumbered by the gravitational wave interferometers, which means that the uh, gravitational wave interferometers on average can see farther than we can right now. And that's the limiting, uh, the, the limiting factor. The other limiting factor me being that uh, the localizations uh, that were achieved by the gravitational wave interferometers were not as good as they were hoping for because that depends on how many interferometers are um, uh, online at any given time. So is there hope for the future? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. There is definitely hope for the future. And um, for observing round number four that starts in December 2022, the statistics is between three and ten neutron stars over one year, neutron star mergers. So let's hope that they are close enough for us to do, uh, to do something. Uh, thank you so much for your question, yeah. OK, 
think there was. Uh, So uh, first of all, I want to say like you had wonderful, wonderful presentation, and um, my question is, what dictates the uh, direction of the what do you call it, the gamma rays? Oh yeah, so yeah, what is what dictates the direction of the gamma rays? So the gamma rays are mostly coming from the jet. Mm -hmm. uh, so wherever the jet is pointing, you're gonna produce gamma rays. Yeah. But um, is but there any predictors to that? It related to the orbit of your neutron star couple, uh, the two neutron stars. So most likely the jet is oriented perpendicular to the orbit. But with respect to Earth, of course, that can be uh, in any mm -hmm. in any possible configuration. Uh, a follow-up question: Does the jet have to hit Earth or the satellite directly for the satellite to detect it? And the gamma rays have to, yes. Uh, so the gamma rays have to intersect uh, the satellite, and that's why, uh, and that's why, when you say I detected one gamma ray burst, uh, on average it means that there are many that you missed because they were not pointing at us. Was there a follow-up from the first gentleman there? Yeah, two things. One thing I was wondering was that. You said that we saw gamma rays uniformly. So does that mean that all the past neutron star mergers, you know, some of them were pointing towards the Earth and we just continue to see the gamma ray mergers from those? The second question I have was, when do we build the other LIGOs? Are we doing one in <laughs> India, right? And they are, you are, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Virgo one is already working. Yeah. For, and then there's one in Japan. In right? Japan, yeah, yes, yeah. very true, very true, very true. Yeah, so the first question was, uh, I said that the, uh, the gamma rays were coming from everywhere. So they last shortly. They last like uh, two seconds, uh, typically, for this event. But yeah, if you plot their locations in the sky, they are all from all over the place, uniformly distributed. And that's because galaxies, at that distance, on average, they are. Yeah, uh, distributed that way. And that's you're very right. Uh, together with LIGO, uh, there will be um, uh, Kagura, which is a uh, Japanese one, uh, that will be able to join probably LIGO, at least for some portion of time. LIGO, uh, Virgo is also joining. Uh, and, and then there is LIGO India that will eventually uh, join, and that will be extremely, uh, extremely powerful. So the more you have, the best it is because it allows us to localize better. So uh, that's, uh, that's the game, yeah. And the next question is from the very top to your left. Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting and challenging. Do we have any sense of the impact of these gamma ray bursts on our planet or on humans? Is anyone looking into this? Yes and yes. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, the good news is uh, that uh, our own galaxy is most likely not a good place uh, to produce, uh, the probability that it will produce a neutron star merger while we are alive is, is very, very tiny. So the, we would be in troubles uh, if there a gamma ray burst were to happen in the, on our own galaxy and if it were pointing at us on Earth. There are studies that actually demonstrate that, yes, we would be in deep troubles in that case. Yeah, uh, but uh, <laughs> most likely uh, that will not, will not happen. Okay, next one is also at the top, but on the other side. Oh, yeah. I'd like to add my uh, congratulations uh, to an excellent seminar as well. Um, <clears throat> is it possible to actually um, s uh, determine which heavy elements are formed spectroscopically somehow? <laughs> Great question. It's a fantastic question. Yeah. So uh, yes and no. So the uh, the issue is the following: that uh, one uh, would hope that uh, one uh, element would produce one line, and then I see that line in my spectrum, and I can say yes, I produced this element. Here is a challenge: that these things are really moving fast really, really, really fast. And that means that, when I say fast, it, it means like 30% the speed of light. Even the slow stuff in this event is 30% the speed of light. What that means is that any line uh, signature will be very much broadened. And then when you have multiple of those, and in this case we are talking about uh, 
sometimes millions of possible uh, transitions, then it's all blend together. So people have been working hard uh, to try to play the game that you are saying, uh, to go from this is the signature, this I tell exactly what element you produce. And there have been uh, claims of uh, uh, strontium uh, found in this particular object. I would say that this uh, very, very solid scientific statement is that we do know that we are producing what we call our process material, that, um, that means we are producing heavy elements. Exactly uh, what element uh, from the spectra that I showed, that's a different, uh, it's a different question that we, have, we are working on it. One more from the top there on the right hand side. Mary is, okay, there are two on Mary's side. Um, hi there. First off, thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. And um, I was noticing, like, during all the diagrams, that uh, the, the geometry of um, the emerging neuron star or neutron stars, pardon, remind me a lot of pulsars. And I know that pulsars are, correct me if I'm wrong, please, um, like bursts of like radiation and electromagnetism that come from rotating neutron stars. And are those something that are studied when it comes to like neutron stars and the merging events? Huh. Yeah, so uh, th we have no evidence for any pulsar being uh, involved, but it's also because of uh, our uh, neutron star that are merging are really, 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 really far away. Uh, so it's mostly uh, a, a problem related to that one. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I don't see a reason why uh, two, two pulsars could not uh, produce a, um, a GW17817 like event. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, thank you again for your talk. And oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was trying. Okay, all right. Um, you mentioned multiple times that um, radio waves and x-rays share a lot of properties um, that are like not shared by the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, why do those specific ranges like share yeah. a lot of their properties? Yeah, great question. So the reason uh, has to do with the magnetic fields uh, that were mentioned uh, not too long ago with the, with the pulsars. So basically, uh, x-rays and radio, they are synchrotron emission. So this is a mission that comes from every time you put an electron in some uh, magnetic field, it will produce uh, this type of radiation that we, we call synchrotron. So a synchrotron uh, has a very broad uh, spectrum, so it will illuminate the whole thing from the gam from for the gamma rays all the way to the radio. So even if the X-rays and radio are very far away in, the, in their spectrum, they are actually the same physical component. And of course, uh, it's not that in the middle that uh, stops. So the optical as well gets some synchrotron emission, but on average, the optical is completely dominated by that other component that we call thermal component that produces the heavy elements. So you have to wait for the heavy elements uh, part to be over before the optical also joins X-rays and radio in that very broad, broad spectrum. Yeah, awesome. One from the fourth row down, right in the middle here. Okay, so I actually have a question before the presentation began. Yeah, so anyways, uh, like last week I was checking my email and so far, like, I think there's a new exhibit coming soon. Either that's already here. If so, then uh, where's it located? Oh, yeah, that one. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you for helping me out with <laughs> Got one at the top that'll hear. Two questions over on your side, Mary. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Um, so you said that um, you're thinking that GW 
seventeen zero eight seventeen. I, th I think I got that right. Yeah. Is um, you're thinking that it's formed a black hole. Mm -hmm. What would it? What hmm. would you be expecting to see if it were actually formed a neutron star? Haha! <laughs> great, great, great question. Thank you for asking. So here's the thing. So if we uh, the the huge difference when we form a black hole and if we were to form a neutron star is that if we form a black hole, we can dump a lot of energy inside and that is lost forever. If uh, we form a neutron star instead, I can have some hope to extract some uh, relevant amount of energy from the, that neutron star. And specifically, uh, if we, um, what we think uh, a possible neutron star remnant can be is that of a neutron star that would be rotating very fast. If that is true, uh, we might hope to actually tap into that energy reservoir and power some of the emission that light that we see. So uh, there are a lot of indirect evidence point at the fact that in this specific case, we might have formed a neutron star, but for a very short amount of time, maybe for less than one second. And after that second, we collapsed into a black hole. Instead, it's highly improbable, but here I want to be very clear, this is my personal scientific opinion, that there is a neutron star alive right there, because otherwise we would have, in my opinion, we should have seen something way more energetic, because uh, maybe I, I could have tapped into the rotational energy of the neutron star. Um, a second level, a bit deeper uh, answer has to do with the colors of that uh, kilonova that I showed, and I showed you that it has a blue component and a red component. That color also has to do with the life of an uh, intermediate stage of a neutron star. So the fact that it exists means that probably an intermediate stage of a neutron star was there, but uh, the fact that later on we didn't see as much energy means that most likely the neutron star has collapsed into a black hole after one second-ish. Our inaugural online audience is being very shy. <laughs> so there was another question on Mary's side, right there. Again, I'd think, like to thank you for a wonderful presentation, really excellent. Um, I'm wondering about, in that you mentioned the difference between the synchrotron radiation and the thermal radiation, and I'm wondering about when these objects collide, are they spewing out like loads of hot material from the neutron stars, and that is like cooking off to produce these these events, and does it radiate thermally? I mean, if it's neutrons, how do they make, ra how do they make uh, optical radiation? Are they breaking down to produce the electrons and then producing mm -hmm. the heavier elements? How, how, how does that happen? Thank yeah. you. So the, yeah, this is uh, <laughs> in two seconds. So let's see how can I answer this. All right. So first of all, uh, is the, after the neutron star merger, do you have uh, stuff flying out? Yes, you do. Uh, and uh, we can measure velocities that are between 10% and 30% the speed of light. And not only we know that, but also there is a difference between the stuff that is uh, expanding on the equator and the stuff that is on the poles. Like the blue, uh, the blue kilonova is most likely on the poles, while the red stuff is most likely on the equator. So then the other question is how, is that hot? Yes, it is, it's like 10,000 Kelvin, 10,000 uh, degrees. And uh, is that uh, super hot? I would not say so, because I deal with uh, supernovae that can be much hotter. And that's a common misconception in our field to think about neutron star mergers as super hot, but they are 10,000 Kelvin, okay. Not, they're hot, but not, <laughs> not as hot. But how do we get to, how, how do we get to the thermal radiation? Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, whenever you have densities that are high enough uh, to basically thermalize uh, whatever input of energy you have, you start producing black body radiation. So that's how you produce photons. And uh, neutrons, you're very right, th that's a key word. The reason why we produce heavy elements has to do with the chemical composition of these two balls that are, that are crushing uh, against each other. If there were not, so if this matter was not as neutron rich, we would not uh, be in the position to produce uh, heavy elements. So you're right on all the, <laughs> all the aspects. So this is uh, uh, the answer in like uh, a course, entire course on neutron star mergers <laughs> in one sentence. And if there are no, the one more question. 
Three more questions. <laughs> the last minute rush. All right, thanks. It was a wonderful presentation. Thanks again. You, you alluded to something about um, the fact that we don't really need to worry about gamma ray bursts in the current universe. And I'd heard before that the gamma ray bursts are sort of a function of the young universe. Is that why you were thinking that's the case? And if so, how come they're a young universe thing and not a now thing? Yeah. And am I safe? <laughs> I think we are very safe. I think we're going to kill each other before a gamma ray burst would kill us. <laughs> but uh, they, but that they, that's my personal opinion. But uh, so uh, when I say gamma ray burst, I sort of cheated because I didn't tell the full story. There are two types of gamma ray bursts. And one is what we call short gamma ray bursts, which are the ones associated with neutron star mergers. Short, why? Because they last these two seconds that I kept saying in the gamma rays. And those come from neutron stars that are merging. The other type has to do with instead massive stars. They are the long gamma ray bursts. They have to do with one single massive star that is exploding. So uh, that why that is important because the massive star version, the long gamma ray bursts, those are way more frequent in the earlier universe because the massive stars are the first one to die, are the first one that will finish up their fuel and they will explode. The short gamma ray bursts instead, you need to wait for the first star to go off, the second star to go off, and then these gravitational waves have to do a lot of work before bringing those together. So it's very true that in the earlier universe, the long gamma ray bursts were way more dangerous. They were more, there were more of them there. For short gamma ray bursts, that is less of, a, of an argument. But uh, it's just uh, my argument is based on rates. So what's the probability that it will, will happen? It's, it's low. However, <laughs> however, it turns out that uh, people that study the ocean floors they actually, uh, they, you can actually find uh, information about uh, stellar explosions that happen close by, and even neutron star mergers that might have happened close by, by studying the sediments, the chemical composition. So some must have <laughs> happened. Some neutron star merger must have happened. But it's just, just in our, on our lifetime, the probability is very, is very small. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The, <coughs> excuse me. You there. Yes. Sorry. Uh, just wondering, yeah, you know, and you said this obviously was uh, one way of forming heavy elements. Uh, and, uh, you know, previously it was thought that, uh, I guess, just uh, regular, super, regular supernovas did most of the work. Yeah. Uh, what kind of percentage? I mean, <laughs> We still think that happened? Great question. So I wish I had the answer. This mm -hmm. is what we're trying to find out. So based on the modeling uh, of the data that I've showed you, the, uh, the blue and the red, especially the red component of the kilonova, we can actually estimate how much mass, how much of those heavy elements uh, were formed in this specific event. And if you do numbers based on, OK, let's, let me assume that we have observed n equal one event. <laughs> Let me assume that everybody looks like that one, which <laughs> you're laughing, right? It's already a very wild assumption. But if every other neutron star merger is similar to this one that we have seen, then we might be even in the position of producing too much. So uh, the short answer is that nobody really knows uh, what is the fraction uh, that uh, comes from one or the other. That's something we are trying to find out. And uh, the one solid statement is that we know for sure that neutron star mergers do contribute to the chemical evolution of the universe. How much? Open question. So uh, we're trying, trying to answer your question, basically. And our last question is from the same row, just a little farther down to the right. Yeah. Right. Here. You're there. <laughs> I just want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, he kind of actually asked some of my question. Um, if we're safe, cool. But um, I just want to know, like, this kind of thing, um, a neutral star, right? Like, would this kind of event, would it affect our universe greatly? In a, in a sense where it's like, it might not affect it now, but sometimes it will affect some way in the future. I would say that some of the elements that we have here on Earth they must be coming from neutron star mergers. So they, they did affect us deeply already. So that's uh, my answer. A lot of the heavy, heavy elements that we use on this planet Earth, they must have come from a neutron star mm -hmm. merger. Maybe from this galaxy, maybe from some other galaxy, but they did it for us. 
So they do affect us deeply in the most beautiful way. <laughs> and if there are no other questions, Rafael Marguti, that was a blast. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Our online audience, thank you for tuning in. Our next talk is on July 16th, when uh, we'll have someone talking about the Viper mission, searching for water ice on the moon. Thank you all very much for joining us. Have a safe trip home. <laughs>